What's happening everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. So subscribe for all kinds of content just like this if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So we're going to do another R tutorial today, and it's going to be over the tidy R package. So in one of my earlier tutorials, I covered the dplyr package, and that's basically your go-to for a lot of things data manipulation and data wrangling related, and just generally getting your data set into a nice clean format so that you can go and do other things. Well, dplyr doesn't give you every functionality in the world, and in fact, tidyr is gonna be particularly useful when we want to convert a data frame into what's known as a tidy format. And for those of you unfamiliar with that term, I'm going to cover it in just a moment here. Now, compared to packages like dplyr or ggplot2, I think there's comparatively fewer functions in tidyr that most people are going to need to be acquainted with. So we're going to step through six key functions from this package today. And those are pivot longer, pivot wider, separate, unite, fill, and complete. So just as a disclaimer, the code in this tutorial that I'm going to use, I heavily adapted from the book R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolemund. So I do highly recommend checking that book out. The link will be in the description of this video as well as in this script. You can get this script from my GitHub repo, and that's also going to be in the description of this video. Now one other thing which I'm going to link to is the cheat sheet for tidyr functions. But it's worth pointing out on this cheat sheet it makes use of some functions which are, at this time anyway, retired. Those functions are gather and spread. Now, the separate and unite functions, those are still in an active development life cycle, but gather and spread have largely been abandoned at this point in favor of newer functions, pivot longer and pivot wider. So just one thing to keep in mind with the cheat sheet. I have not found a more up-to-date cheat sheet on tidyr yet that takes this into account. Now, just as some usual asks before I get into the meat of this tutorial, please smash the like button to this video because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. Also, I do have a link to my Patreon account in the description of this video, so if you guys would be willing to support me that way, that would be enormously appreciated. So without further ado, let's get into this tutorial. So the first thing that we're going to do is call the tidyverse package. Now, I mentioned this in my other tutorials, and I'll say the same thing here. Tidyverse includes tidyr, but it also includes things like dplyr and ggplot2 and tons of other incredibly useful packages. So I do highly recommend just getting used to calling the tidyverse directly, because it's much cleaner and more succinct than calling a whole bunch of individual packages separately. So before we start getting into all these individual functions of tidyr, we have to start with an understanding of what tidy data actually is. So tidyr comes with it several built-in data sets, and they're called table 1, 2, 3, 4a, 4b, and 5. So as one just general point, when you're writing actual code, you should stay away from calling data frames, things like table one and table two and things like that, because that's a really easy way to confuse and trip yourself and whomever's looking at your code up. But nevertheless, we'll work with it here. That's just the built-in tidyr uh, data frames we have here. So if we look at table one, we see a data frame that consists of four individual variables. Those are country, year, cases, and population. So pretty simple and straightforward, right? Now let's look at this other data frame called table 4a. Now this has a lot of very similar information. In fact, it's the exact same data, except we drop the population variable and we just have the cases variable except that variable year was split into two, 1999 and 2000. So technically what's going on here is, this is really one variable year, but it's been split into two columns. 1999 and 2000 are just realizations of one single variable. And we're gonna see a similar thing just in the opposite direction with table two here. So it's got the same sort of information in it. Country, year, cases, 
population, and then these counts. So once again, it is the exact same data that we saw in table one, except these variables, cases and population, have been turned into rows of this data set. So technically, these observations here are just realizations of these individual variables, cases and population, which hold all the other variables like country and year fixed. Now that you've seen some examples of how you could represent the exact same data in a variety of different ways, let's move on to the overall broader concept and definition here. So actually table one, which you saw up above, was the only one which was tidy. Now, the definition of tidy data is as follows. It's that every column is a variable, that every row is an observation, and every cell is a single value. Let's look back up at table one so that you can see this in an example. Once again, every column here represents a unique variable. Every row here is an observation, and every cell here is a value. And so, honestly, most data sets that you're going to run into in the real world are going to be untidy. That doesn't mean they're just crappy bad data or whatever. It's just systems for generating data and collecting it, whatever the case may be. It's not necessarily designed with the concept of tidy data in mind. Not everybody can know or design their systems in advance knowing that this is the most convenient way of storing data in R such that you can pass your data and do whatever the case may be, visualizations, models, whatever it may be. But once you have your data set in a tidy format, it is almost invariably going to be enormously easier to work with. So now hopefully that you understand the concept behind tidy data, let's see how we can get untidy data into a tidy format. So if we start with table 4A, let's take a look at that up here in our, uh, in our viewer here. So this was the instance in which we had three columns, but we had country, and then technically we have the, the variable year, which is spread out across two different columns, and then the rate variable is the actual value in the cells here. So what we want to actually do here is we want to go from this wider format where we have too many columns to a situation where we have more rows. So we want to go from this wider data set to a data set that's less wide but has more rows. And so the function that we're going to use to do that is called pivot longer. The syntax is as follows here. There are three key arguments here. Those are calls, that is columns, those are 1999 and 2000. We have this argument names too. So we're going to condense those columns, turn it into one column. It's going to be called year. And then those values on the inside, they get their own column. And that column is called cases. And then let's just arrange by country and year. Let's see what that looks like. Bam. It's a tidy format. We've got country, we've got year, we've got cases. Again, we have every column is a variable, every row is an observation, and every cell is a value, so it's perfect. Now, one other thing that I'm going to show you is the old gather function, because I guarantee you, you're going to see this in some code out there. And once again, it is on the tidyr cheat sheet. So it's going to do the exact same thing here. It's just the syntax is a little bit different. So you start here by just specifying the columns that you want to gather. That's 1999 and 2000. And then instead of uh, the argument names two, you have an argument called key values two. Instead of that, you have value. So the syntax is very, very similar, except you just manually specify the columns and these argument names are different. But you can confirm just from just looking at, I ran the exact same procedure these two different ways, and I have identical results. So now that we've covered pivot longer, let's look at the opposite problem, which is when you're going to want to use pivot wider. So we go down here, let's take a look at uh, table two. So if you remember with table two, this was the situation in which you have these variables, cases and population, but instead of occupying their own individual columns, they're occupying rows inside one condensed variable called type. 
So we want to go from this longer data set here to a wider data set where cases and population are given their own column. So that's where pivot wider is going to help us out. Now the syntax for this is incredibly similar to pivot longer, except instead of the arguments names to and values to, we have these arguments names from and values from. So let's just run this here. Uh, names from, that's coming from this variable type, and values from are coming from count. We just spread this out and bam, we have the exact same looking data set that we had from table one. And then similarly, we have the retired version of this function, which is spread. Again, it's on the cheat sheet and you'll find it in some code that's out there. It's gonna do the same thing, except instead of names from, the argument is called key. And instead of values from, the argument is just called value. Again, we look at these two results, it's the exact same data. Now we've looked at these situations where you have rows and you want to turn them into columns or you have columns that you want to turn into rows, but sometimes you just have a more simple problem where you have a variable and you want to split that variable into two different variables. Now this is where you're going to want to use the separate function. Let's look at table three and that's going to illustrate this. So if you take a look here, you'll notice we have this variable called rate. And this is actually just the cases and population variables that we saw before from table one, but now they're all condensed into this rate variable. Like you have cases divided by a population here. So you don't want that. You want to split this, this up. So that's where separate is going to come into play here. So just to walk you through the syntax here, it's very straightforward. We're going to separate the rate variable into two different variables, cases and population. Now by default, separate is going to look for the first non-alphanumeric character and it's going to use that as a separator. I like manually specifying this, so I just specify sep equals the slash mark. Then separate also takes this convert argument and that's going to tell the separate function, uh, and R in general I mean, look for the closest variable type once you split this up. Because by default, this rate variable here is a character, but let's just run it here. Because we specified convert equals true, R smartly figured out cases and population are integers, not characters. So just one last step for you. And now sometimes the exact opposite happens. So you have two different variables and you wanna condense them into one single variable. So once again, the exact opposite problem that we were addressing with separate, we're going to address with the unite function. So now let's turn to table five here and notice that you've got century and year separated into different columns here. So we want to unite these different columns into one single column. So that's where unite is going to come into play. And so the syntax here, once again, it's pretty simple. You're going to start by specifying what you want the new variable to be called. We're just going to call it new here. And then the columns that you want to unite into this one single column. That's century and year. Run this and see what we get. So that's a start. I mean, we dropped century and year and we turned them into this variable called new, but this isn't perfect because it's separated by this underscore here. So once again, sometimes you have to pay a little bit of attention to the, uh, to the default settings for these arguments. And so let's specify a few more arguments to unite. So once again, just like before, we start with the new variable name that's new the columns which we want to unite into one, those are century and year. What we want the separator to be, in this case here, it's just nothing, it's just the blank space. So we do that with quote mark, quote mark. And then let's specify remove equals false here. Uh, just because we don't necessarily want to get rid of century and year here. I mean, it'll happen uh, sometimes in this kind of situation. You want to retain these variables just for making visualizations of just time plots or you know, certain models. So let's not remove them here. Uh, and also let's pipe to this. Uh, turn new into an integer. Uh, Unite, unfortunately, doesn't have that convenient 
uh, convert argument built into it. We run this and this looks just like we wanted it to. We have this new column called new. It's an integer. We united century and year. But if we want those columns for anything, they're still here. One last problem that TidyR is really going to help you address is instances of missing data. So to get an idea of this, let's look at an example and actually how there's really two very distinct types of missing data. So I just created this stocks tibble here. Now, if you notice here, there's one explicitly missing value, and that's the value for this variable yield when year is equal to 2015 and the quarter is equal to four. But there's actually one separate kind of missing value here, and it's the yield for quarter one of 2016. So you and I can look at this data set and we see that there's no value for year 2016 and quarter one, uh, although intuitively you would expect it to be, but it's not specified in this data frame. So this type of missing value is what we would call implicitly missing because it's not specified inside of this data frame. We really should have another row here where we've got year 2016, quarter one, and then the yield is an NA. Our function for attacking the problem of explicitly missing values is the function fill. So let's go down here and take a look. So if we run the fill function on stocks, we're going to fill in this yield variable and we're going to specify this argument dot direction to be up. And yes, the argument is dot direction. You do need to specify that dot. That's going to tell R look down and then fill upward. So if you just compare these two bottom to top, all we did was we took the quarter two value for 2016 and filled it upward to quarter four of 2015. So we filled up. I know it's a little counterintuitive. So that's gonna help us tackle the explicitly missing uh, situation. Now, as for the implicitly missing uh, problem, our function for that is going to be complete. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to specify the two variables for which there should be a value, missing or otherwise, for every unique value of them. And if we look at what happened here, it's sort of like a seed table type of situation where for every unique combination of year and quarter, now we have some value of yield, even if that value is missing. So this is a lot more, I mean, the name of the function says it right there. It's more complete. So now hopefully you have a pretty solid foundation in the TidyR package and you see some instances in which it can help you get some nice, tidy, clean data and make your life easier. So I guess have fun cleaning data. So thanks to all of you for watching this video. If you found it helpful, please consider sharing it. Once again, smash the like button and then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard on data.